On Auschwitz. The history of Auschwitz is exceptionally complex. It combined two functions, a concentration camp and an extermination center in gas chambers. Nazi Germany persecuted various groups of people there, and the camp complex continually expanded and transformed itself. In the podcast on Auschwitz, we discuss the details of the camp's history and our contemporary memory of this unique place. A particularly drastic example of betrayal of medical ethics is the participation of many German doctors in the criminal pseudomedical experiments carried out on concentration camp prisoners. I spoke to Teresa von Torcichy of the Memorial Research Center about the experiments conducted at Auschwitz. Except murderous slave labor, the horrible conditions, constant threat of life, some of the prisoners within the concentration camp system were also subjected to pseudomedical experiments that very often resulted in either death or physical harm for those prisoners. And also such shameful pseudomedical experiments were also carried out in the Auschwitz concentration camp. What was the idea behind using prisoners in the camp for experimentations and also what kind of experiments the prisoners of Auschwitz were subjected to. Looking globally at the idea of experimentation in concentration camps, we have to stress just three major issues of the conducting. First was army and the war effort to detect properly the diseases, to treat properly injured soldiers, and also to meet all the other needs which army was bringing on the combat fields. Second was the Nazi ideology which was proclaiming the differences between the races and the position, the super race which was the Nordic considered by the German scientists those days. The other was also the pharmaceutical industry, which was to test basically the new products, new medicines, which were to be introduced in the market in a very wide range. Then in the individual cases, as we may add the fourth element, was just their personal interest to pursue their career, to pursue their interests. In terms of approval, it has got the full support of the main office of the administrative and economic office, as the experiment's cost also can be really surprised. So the certain budget would have to be every time preserved for separate proposals. In person, the Reichsführer SS Heinrich Himmler deeply supported and helped many of the German scientists to start the experimentation in Auschwitz. In Auschwitz, when we look at different doctors and different experiments, mm -hmm. it's important to note that the experiments targeted everyone, that among the groups of prisoners who were experimented on, we'll find men, we'll find women, we'll find children. The scope of different kinds of experiments basically could harm every person that entered into the system. That's also the element which is the differentiation from the other camps that to Auschwitz actually all ages were being deported, the whole families. So all age groups. And if we look at the separate examples of experiments, we will see that they were actually focused on different prisoners. Karl Klauberg was a very famous gynecologist professor. He was the head of the female division in clinic in Silesia region. In summer 1942, he was invited for a meeting in Berlin and some discussion was carried out, which was considered as confidential. The idea was to find the most successful biological method of mass sterilization. Klauberg 
known before as a physician successful in heredity issues, now was to focus on something completely different. He chose as a place for his experimentation Auschwitz because the female camp started to operate here after March 1942. The first place he was offered to organize his lab was in Birkenau, which was at that time under construction. A wooden barrack was given for his disposal, but he found the conditions there as not suitable for his needs. And this is why a few months later, he convinced the commandant of the camp, Rudolf Huss, to move his lab to block number 10, in the main camp in Auschwitz I. The women who were subjected for his experiments were taken from the unloading platform from among the new arriving prisoners. First, they were interviewed very briefly and there were two basic questions asked if they were going through delivery before and if the menstruation circle was still functioning in their case. The women sent for this block were actually from all occupied Europe. The first women were from Belgium, France, later on Greece, Poland, Germany, also Hungary. The method combined two stages. The first was introducing chemical irritant into the reproductive organs of the women. This was to cause the closing of the fallopian tubes. The chemical caused pain, caused very often some harm, some fever. A few weeks later, the women were again taken for the next stage. This time, the different type of chemical was introduced in the reproductive organs in order to see if the uh, tubes are really closed. The chemical also consisted kind of contrast, so the X-ray could see how the result of the process looked like. The women were staying in this block for a few weeks and later on they were sent back for Birkenau for work. In few cases, after a few weeks, again they were brought to this building to check the result. Klauberg was not the only one who was focusing on the sterilization project. The other one, um, was Horst Schumann, a military doctor, and he chose for his purpose X-ray, especially Siemens production of two X-ray machines was brought for him to Birkenau, and also a special cabin was organized and he could from the distance start the devices. Prisoners used for his method, they were men and women. And the idea was to introduce a certain dose of the radiation on the organs, which were, because of the doses, destroyed. It caused burns, it caused wounds. After the first radiation, the prisoners were again usually sent for, for the camp. In few cases, they were kept in block number 10. And then the second stage of the experiment was surgery. The organs which were ruined because of the doses were to be taken for the hospital for an operation, in both cases, men and women. The scientists, as they were called because of their task, they were to report about the results. So Klauberg wrote a letter, extended letter, in 1914 for saying that with the basic help of 10 people from the medical staff, he was able to sterilize per day approximately 1,000 women. Schumann also has to report his result and he prepared an article. And in this article, he described with details all the cases, all the results. And as a summary, he wrote that this method was found unsuccessful because of the injuries, because of the sepsis which appeared also in the cases of death. So his opinion was that eventually castration could be the most effective method. The doctor which is the most connected with the medical experiments here in Auschwitz is 
uh, Josef Mengele. And as we talk about the different age groups, he is actually the best example. He was, as a student, very talented person. He finished university with two PhDs, one in anthropology, the second one in medicine. And as a young person, he was immediately found as a person, as a staff member of the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute run by Professor von Verschuer in Berlin. The main interest of the research of Professor von Verschuer was the heredity. And his idea was that the best cases in analyzing this process and the different features, different genes, are the cases of twins and triplets. But in normal situation to have the chance for such an extent test experiment wasn't available. As the adults, the twins are usually separated, so they could found only twins in the very young age. So, back to Mengele. When the war started, he was sent to the army as a military doctor. After finishing his service in Eastern Front, he returned to Germany. After short recovery, he again was called for the institute in Berlin. And within this time, here in Auschwitz, exactly in Birkenau, the family camp for Sinti and Roma was established where the whole families, different age, sometimes in two or even three generations were deported. And just this place turned out to be for Professor von Verschuer and eventually Mengele interest the best occasion for finding the new cases. So Mengele appeared in Birkenau at the end of May 1943 and very shortly he developed his interest. Not only twins and triplets, he started to be interested in people with different anatomical abnormalities, then with people with different eye color, then also some other cases which were interesting for him, especially the disease which uh, appeared in Sinti and Roma camp in summer 1943 called water cancer or cancer of the cheek especially children were suffering from this disease. And what kind of procedure he introduced? So for twins and triplets, the procedure started with the interview and different stages of anthropological documentation with measurements, with information about the diseases which were in the family. And then the final stage of the experiment was the autopsy. So the children or adults, they were killed with phenol injection and the pathologist was to finish the documentation with the autopsy. In terms of children who are suffering from the cancer of a cheek, they started with some medication and better treatment. First of all, better food with more vitamins and after they noticed some changes in the wound, the experiment was closed by the lethal injection and in few cases the heads were also taken for the analysis. They were just used as a material for the labs, for uh, very often sent even to Germany. Mengele did not work himself. From among the prisoners, he chose specialists, very often world-famous doctors. For example, for all the pediatrical issues, Professor Bertolt Epstein, Czech doctor, was to be involved in the documentation. Then for the anthropology, he was using Dr. Martina Puzyna, the assistant of Professor Jan Czekanowski, very famous Polish anthropologist. Not only medical documentation was prepared, he also was interested in having different type of files, like for example, some drawings. A Czech prisoner, Slamar, was to prepare the portraits of the Sinti and Roma. And later on, Dina Gottliebova was also to prepare some of the portraits of so-called mischlings, so the Romas from mixed marriages. Klauberg and Mengele appear in the camp with the plan for experiments. Another doctor, uh, Dr. Kremer, came here, we may say, accidentally because he came as a replacement. A doctor 
who was here actually three months. And he came from Prague. He was serving in a military hospital in Prague because the doctors here were some of them on a sick leave. So they needed replacement. They needed the support. Johann Paul Kremer was professor of medical university in Minster. He was lecturing in anatomy. And here in Auschwitz, he was sent for the duties which were typical for the other doctors, like he was to carry the selections on the unloading platform, decide about life and death among the Jewish prisoners brought here. Then he had also the duties in the hospital, camp hospital, and just being there, he noticed that the prisoners who were exhausted because of starvation are having some changes on their skin color and generally they are physically changing. So he decided to start an experiment by choosing from among the exhausted prisoners a group and he started with the interview. Interview concerning their medical history, information about their wave, about family diseases. Then the prisoners were killed with the injections and some organs like the liver, spleen, were extracted using the surgical method and as samples were sent for, for Germany, for mainly Minster University. And on the labels, on the packages, Kramer urged to put a label that this shipping is important for the military efforts of Germany. It's also important to note that he kept a diary and when we want to learn a little bit about the life of an SS doctor, not only in Auschwitz, but for us the particular interesting period is his uh, service in Auschwitz. Looking into his diary is a very powerful lecture because of the brevity of the wording, because of a very short description, but I think it is even more powerful when we look at this document this way. It's absolutely unique material if we analyze, well, generally the doctor role in the war and just the three months in Auschwitz. He was brief in his captions, but very detailed, very precise what he was doing. He thought that being only three months here in Auschwitz and considering the fact that so much of the documentation is destroyed, actually he won't be targeted by court, by any institution of what he was doing here, until his diary was found. And it turned out that not only the prisoners were remembering his experiments, but also he was writing himself about packages being sent to Germany, or in very few words, sentences, he was just describing the medical cases he found here as interesting for him. Kremer wasn't the only surprising mm -hmm. doctor appearing in Auschwitz, making the experiments accidentally, let's say. Some of the doctors have never been here. For example, Professor August Hirt, he was professor at the university in Strasbourg, and he was especially interested in uh, racial ideology. He was to found the scientific justification, explanation, and all this proof for this ideology. In very few universities those days, there were collections of skeletons from different parts of the world. And knowing that Auschwitz is a place that people from so many different places are being deported. He sent here his representatives to choose. He wanted a large group of 100 people to be selected, but eventually 86 Jewish prisoners were chosen. Most of them were men, a smaller group of women. They were from all over Europe. They were again interviewed. They were tested if they are not carrying any dangerous diseases. And the whole group was transferred to the camp in Natzweiler Struthof. Right after arrival, they were all killed. They were murdered in the gas chamber there. Then all the corpses were given to the disposal of Professor Hirt, who hired the pathologist to prepare the collection of Jewish skeletons. The corpses were 
partly prepared for the whole procedure. And because of the changes in the front, Western front, the whole project wasn't finished. So when the Allied forces enter the labs, they found a huge tabs with parts of the human bodies. Later on, the remains, they were buried on the local cemetery. Another physician who, again, has never been here was Kurt Heismeyer. He was the specialist in pulmonology. At that time, looking for the best methods of healing tuberculosis was really advanced, so he couldn't find a good institution which would give him credits for his proposal. Eventually, he used his uncle, who was a general, and this is how he was allowed to start his experimentation first in Neuengamme. He was using mainly the Soviet prisoners of war. And then he was allowed to experiment also on children. And for his request, 20 children from Auschwitz, 10 boys, 10 girls, aged from 6 to 12, were selected. Some minor tests were done here in Auschwitz. Then, together with the assistants, they were medical staff, they were doctors, they were all transferred for Neuengamme. The idea of Heismeyer was to introduce the treatment of tuberculosis by using the different type of infection, like, for example, the skin tuberculosis. So the children were, first of all, infected with the pulmonary tuberculosis, and that was to be the beginning of the experimentation. But again, the situation in the war has changed. It was already spring of 1945, so the Allied forces were approaching Neuengamme, and the children who were sick because of the infections, they were hung in the basement of one of the schools nearby, together with the doctors, with the nurses who were also prisoners, who were taking care of the children. Did the situation in the camp, we know that because of the sanitary conditions, contagious diseases was a very important element of the daily uh, life of the camp, but it also could endanger the life of the SS garrison. Did this situation also result in experiments that could help the Germans to find cure for some of the diseases that were present in the camp? The pharmaceutical industry found the place as a great challenge for many medicines. They were not having given the name at that stage, they were having just the numbers which were used in the production process to be tested here in different circumstances. Some of them were strictly connected with the combat situation. So the prisoners were injured and they were wrapped some creams, some liquids, or they have to swallow some tablets or syrups. The reactions were carefully written down with all the information about the fever, all the changes. So that was part of the quite important experiment for this industry. But then also the doctors themselves started to think about the possibilities in dealing with the contagious uh, diseases, like for example, typhus was dangerous. Dangerous not only for the prisoners, they were mainly dying because of typhus, but also the SS staff, they were contracting this disease. Mengele, as we mentioned before, was out of duty because he contracted typhus. The standard arts, so the doctor of the garrison, the most important person from the medical point of view here in the camp, did not suffer from typhus, but he brought typhus home. His wife was suffering from typhus, so it was a challenge for the doctors. And some of them, for example, started to test the blood of the prisoners which moment the blood is still infected, which moment it's already free of this, of this virus. So they were actually infecting the prisoners on purpose and then by taking the blood, this type of experiments were uh, carried. Another type of medical procedure that can be considered close to medical experimentation uh, when we look at Auschwitz is surgery, because on one hand we have those 
experienced researchers who are sent to Auschwitz for their research. On the other hand, within the structure of the SS medical staff, we have young, not yet experienced doctors, surgeons, who can become better doctors thanks to the reality of the camp. When we look at the medical here in Auschwitz, especially at the biography of the doctors, we may see that majority of them were young men. A few years after finishing the med school, so from the professional point of view, they were not so qualified in their fields. And to pursue their career, they have to take examination, just regular, normal line, the professional line as all the doctors. So they needed practice and some of them wanted to specialize in surgery. So in one of the buildings here, building number 21, the lab was organized and few of the doctors, Entres, Klein, Tilo, they started to practice surgery. They didn't have someone who would be the teacher, as we may say. So from among the prisoners, they chose surgeon and they were very good, experienced surgeons. So as they are saying in some of the operations they were to assist as a prisoner doctor, they have to be very careful with how they behave, what they are saying, how they react to what the German doctor is doing. In some cases, as they are saying in their testimonies, they could easily notice that the German doctor is not having the talent for surgery at all. His hands are not for surgery. His fingers are not the fingers of the surgeon. So in many cases, the operation would be unsuccessful. It means that the prisoner who was on the table would definitely die. So in order not to kill the prisoner and also to kind of play a game with the German doctor, they were finishing this operation being kind and friendly and very professional to the German doctor and at the same time trying to save the prisoner who was on the operation table. In fact, it was in a, an, an operation. Some of the operations were having the medical justification. They were to really help the prisoners. But in some cases, it was just training. When we talk about pseudo-medical experiments, uh, adding a word criminal experiments is also very important because as we could hear, most of the doctors didn't really care about the fate of people that they were experimenting on. Many of the experiments planned the death of the prisoners, so we are talking about very few survivors of these crimes. This is very true. Some of them were actually having the intention that the final stage, finishing the documentation, because that was what was important for the, for the doctors, was the autopsy. That was in terms of, uh, for example, Mengele's experimentation. He was using two pathologies. The first was French doctor, Jakub Wexler. Later on, after June 1944, Hungarian pathologist Niklas Nischli. Their descriptions were to be very professional, as Mengele expected from them really high quality of their skills. The same was for the other doctors like Professor Hirt. But in some cases, like Klauberg and Schumann, the idea was to see the full result in time space. So this is why most of the women who were taken for experimentation, they survived. They were sent for the camp and they were called for some post-analysis. If we consider the experimentation of Kurt Heismeyer, most probably his project included further analysis, but the war situation pushed him to this horrible decision and the order to murder in such a brutal way all the children and all the people who were assisting this group of 20 uh, children. Most of the documentation of the experiment was destroyed during the evacuation, so it causes several problems for us who try to research and learn the story of the 
experiments. On one hand, the problem is that we are not able to give the number of victims of many of the experiments because there is simply no documents. On the other hand, there was a different problem already after the war because some of the survivors of the experiments try to get some kind of compensations for the suffering and without proper documentation it was very difficult. The medical crime committed in uh, concentration camps, first of all, was first presented during the first trials in Nuremberg, the trial of the doctors. So it was a very important issue for medical world, first of all, but also as an element of justice. A budget was prepared and some compensation, some financial aid was prepared for the victims. In terms of Auschwitz, the very urgent issue was lack of documentation. As we know, almost 95% of the documentation was destroyed. How to prove even the fact that the person was deported to the camp? There was no any record in the archive. In so many cases, the people were having the number tattoos during the registration in the camp and still in the collection of documents there was no single information about them being deported here. So there was just this very difficult dilemmas for the whole process. In terms of survivors of Auschwitz who were after the war in Eastern Europe, there was one more thing, the separation of Europe, the division into two blocks. So until 1972, the survivors of Auschwitz who were victims of the medical experiments were not allowed to apply for this type of aid or any type of compensation. There was no contact between the Western Germany and Poland. Only after 1972, the special office was established by the Minister of Health and the documentation started to be considered. So in our archive, we do have correspondence between the different survivors who are asking for any type of documentation. We've got long letters when they describe what kind of experimentation they were subjected for. In the archive, unfortunately, there was nothing about this. Very often, there was not even information to prove that they were established here. So many, many of the applications were turned down. In the first phase, 3,500 people were eventually paid some aid, general for concentration camps. As the budget was still available, so there was a second turn in the 80s, and this time over 500 people were paid just this aid. Not a regular compensation, not something what were paid as something what was added for the retired pension. It was just a one-time amount of money. What about the responsibility of the doctors? So after the war, some of them tried to disappear. Professor Klauberg was arrested right after the war by the Red Army and was taken for Moscow. In Moscow, he was taken for the trial and sentenced for imprisonment. Ten years later, when there was the agreement between Western Germany and the uh, Soviet Union, he returned to Germany and he intended to start practice. He even organized a place and he put in the local newspaper an announcement about hiring the office worker. So she would have to run the office, she should be skilled in typing methods. He even mentioned the working hours and he put his name in this announcement. It was found by survivors who were living around and he was arrested. He was taken for court and he died during the preparation for the trial. Horst Schumann, first he was in Germany for several years and in the 60s he left for first Japan then he was in Africa, in Sudan, then in Nigeria, then in Ghana he was identified, arrested 
and sent for Germany for the trial. In all the African places he was, he was still practicing medicine. He was a doctor. Preparation for the trial started and he died during this time, so the trial never uh, started. Mengele, the person associated with the experimentation in Auschwitz, after the war was arrested and put to the camp as the prisoner of war. He was even registered in this camp with his own name and he was released. Then he started to hide and thanks to his wealthy family and also other supporters, he managed to leave Europe. He flew to South America and he died in South America in 1979 having the stroke during the uh, swimming in the sea. Professor Hirt, right after the end of the war, was hiding and he committed suicide. Standor Arzt, so the main doctor here in Auschwitz for most of the camp existence, Dr. Eduard Wirtz, was arrested and the preparation for the trial started but he also took his life in prison. Few of the other doctors, Wetter, Entres, Klein, they faced justice during the trial of the Mauthausen staff and the sentence given was death sentence and the sentence was carried out. All the doctors who were holding the titles of professors, doctors, they were all of them actually stripped of these titles, but in a different period of time. For example, Mengele, the process was only in the, in the 60s. So we may say for the medical world, it was a long process to acknowledge the scale of the crime committed by the doctors in concentration camps. The last question I would like to ask is the question about this responsibility on one hand from a more universal aspect, the ethics of doctors, uh, the warning that the story can give to the medical world today, but also ethical challenge. What if they discovered something that would be valuable for humanity and what would we do with the results of these horrible crimes? What is the warning? Looking with details on all the material of the experimentation, we may have the impression that it was in terms of medicine, in terms of proper analysis, carried out with all the very correct and very professional approach. And also we may get the impression that it was to actually help the condition of the prisoners, to stop the spread of the diseases to have a better methods of curing some of the very dangerous diseases which the humanity was facing. But we need another material, the testimonies of the survivors. And as we were saying, for example, the, the diary of Dr. Kramer, showing what were the circumstances of gathering this material. And it's still a warning and it's still great moral ethical dilemma for the medical world how the knowledge, great knowledge and the dedication for medicine, the dedication for saving life can be manipulated with politics and eventually it can be turned into crime. Crime of innocent people, different age, and with, as we say, with the white gloves of people who never visited this place, most probably never seen the victims of their experimentation, being interested only in the records, in the papers, only focus on their own career to pursue the next stage of their career, to be completely uninterested on a person, a patient, a human being who, in fact, was to be priority for the doctor.
You can find all our On Auschwitz podcasts at www.auschwitz.org slash podcasts.